you. Excellent. So thank you, everyone. Appreciate your time today, uh, taking some valuable time out of your day to uh, listen to me uh, expound and uh, babble about knowledge management, maybe. But hopefully you get something out of this. So today we're going to talk about uh, how you can take the knowledge management process to another level. So where this came from in my mind is that typically organizations think of or focus on knowledge as something related to incident or problem that is the knowledge base, knowledge articles, solution articles, those things that allow you to effectively uh, improve resolution times, to resolve issues, to identify or resolve problems, those kind of things. And that is a very important part of knowledge management. But it is certainly not the only part of knowledge management. And what I've recognized over the years is that people or organizations don't kind of look at the full process and what it can do for you. So what we're going to do today is talk about some of those things, how we can take knowledge management as a process and move it beyond just looking at the knowledge base and uh, improving that. So uh, first off, we're going to lay some groundwork and some foundational definitional type things so we understand what knowledge management really is the DIKW cycle and how that works. Then we're going to talk about some techniques for taking knowledge management to that next level, including learning loops, systems thinking, effective questioning, and then we'll kind of summarize at the end. <clears throat> so hopefully everyone's ready to go on this journey. So let's talk about knowledge management as a process and this concept of DIKW. So as I indicated, many organizations focus on this thing known as the knowledge base, uh, which is really that repository where you're keeping articles of some type or uh, some type of um, text or word type um, information, I guess you might put it, that helps you resolve incidents or helps you um, resolve problems. But knowledge management is really so much more than that. It, like any of the other ITIL processes, is a process. There are steps that you follow to do knowledge management. Uh, the first step is really this strategy step. And the strategy step is where you really kind of think about, as an organization, how do you want to organize and slice and dice and keep track of these things called knowledge or this stuff called knowledge. So this is where you're going to sort of identify what types of knowledge you have out there, uh, capture, uh, figure out how you're going to capture it. You might put together an enterprise glossary to help you kind of identify what terms are, are the common usage terms around the organization, etc. Once you've kind of figured out how you're going to approach knowledge management, then you have to do the transfer. And that's where you're going to go out and determine what is the best way for knowledge to come in and out of whatever repository you want to have it in. And how do you get that information, say, from people's heads down on paper or into some kind of accessible means? And this is where you have to kind of think about different people's learning styles and their behavior. Are they more visual? Are they more verbal? Are they more hands-on and kind of think about how do you transfer based on each of those methods and what their particular um, styles are. Then once you've sort of transferred and gotten that or captured that information and transferred it, figured out the, the pipeline for transferring it back and forth, how do you manage it? How do you keep track and make sure that the knowledge is accurate, up to date, that it's being used in the way that it's supposed to? Well, that's where we look to those repositories. And this is really that where people focus, right, is in that knowledge base or information architecture. Uh, ITIL talks about the service knowledge management system this bigger entity that contains all of your decision-making tools. So you have to have a means of keeping track and guiding and managing that information that you're transferring back and forth. And then finally, you have to have people use the knowledge. So how are you going to manage or control who's using it, when they're using it? So you start getting into a little bit of maintenance and ownership and metrics and keeping track of which items are being used to uh, which level, which things are old and out of date and need to be archived. And then that should then rinse and repeat back into how you're doing your strategy. Is your st strategy still in line with the usage? Now you'll note though, as you go through this process, what you're really doing Doing is translating or transforming data into information, information into knowledge, and knowledge into wisdom. And then that wisdom informs what data 
and uh, how you capture some of that new data. And that's really where you, you have to kind of think about this bigger picture of transformation. So knowledge is as much learning and transformation as it is uh, repositories. So let's talk about these, this concept of DIKW. So DIKW, if you're not familiar, stands for Data Information Knowledge and Wisdom. Data, this is just discrete facts, ones and zeros, piles of numbers, in and of itself does not really have a whole lot of meaning. It is just raw data, very, very raw. When you take that data and you contextualize it and organize it in some fashion, now it becomes information. But it's still too raw, really, to make decisions from. It, it isn't telling you so much. What you have to do is take that information, you have to apply thought to it, and analysis, and experience, and insights, and value, and all of these type of things, and that what's, that's what converts information into knowledge. And then when you use that knowledge to make decisions, and you reflect back on that in what we'll call double loop learning, you really gain wisdom. And wisdom is the only one of these that you can't really keep in a repository. That's in what we call the biological CMDBs, people's brains. But it is an important aspect of this whole DIKW um, ladder or transformation. So let's look a little closer at each of these. So here's an example of what you might call data. So here is a set of information and data about uh, records or incidents or production calls, whatever you uh, may be using. The data itself is just the items in each individual cell. Right, so 51, 29, 19, this is just data. In and of itself, it doesn't really tell me a lot. It tells me some things that on April 3rd, there were 51 uh, open records that week. Uh, 15 of those got closed. Okay, so I have some data. I, I'm not sure what I can do with that. I have to kind of start to convert it into information, which is when you start to look down the individual columns and sort of organize. All right, here I have all of these bits of information, 5, 9, 11.25, whatever number you may have, whatever data, but now I'm grouping it. I'm organizing it into some fashion. I'm taking it and saying, okay, from April 3rd on down to August 21st, what was the set of numbers or the set of data that made up my average daily close? So I've got to take that data, I've got to start to organize it. And tools like Excel and these are, are great for organizing it, but it could also be organized using other types and other means. Uh, certainly some of your ITSM tools uh, have the capability to do some of that. Once I have that information, I need to convert it into knowledge. And how do I do that? Well, this is where you start getting into some of the more um, com well, complex, could be uh, a word used here, but more sophisticated or robust tools or uh, mechanisms. In this case, what I did was I took the information and I converted it into a control chart. So if you're not familiar with a control chart, it's a statistical method to identify when things are sort of out of control, out of statistical control. That is, they're not acting in a, in a predictable or um, expected way. There's sort of randomness thrown in or noise thrown in, and we want to look at uh, what is causing that. So once I take that information converted to knowledge, I can then start to pinpoint uh, some, some items, and then I can start asking a couple of questions. And the key questions for converting information into knowledge are how and why. So how did these situations or these incidents occur, and why did these incidents occur? Those are the two questions that really are powerful in converting. So we can start to look and say, okay, in this control chart, a single point that is dropping unexpectedly might be an incident. A single point that is falling outside of my norm, that might be a problem because it's really outside my expectations or a continued sweep, as you see in the middle, uh, in a particular direction might indicate a problem. And then when I make a change, I start to see that I'm really starting to control down what is my norm. So change is really a control process in that it really helps you to control what is normal, what is not normal. 
And so I can start to apply, once I have knowledge, I can start to apply or connect in to some of the ITIL processes that are related to knowledge, such as incident problem change, service level, business relationship, all of the other processes really depend on, on knowledge management. And it's really this sort of connection then um, that makes the difference here. So I might then go open problem records or go back and look at a particular incidents, asking those questions, how did these occur? and more importantly, why did they occur? Once I've answered those questions, I really convert knowledge into wisdom. And here it's really about learning. Wisdom is what we gain from that knowledge once we've made a decision or once we've taken an action. What, what lesson did we learn? What knowledge did we gain? What insight came out of that to sort of factor into our next decisions? And once we sort of move into this realm, we have to be very careful to avoid assumptions or opinions and really focus on what is fact versus opinion. And it's a really, really powerful question. So knowing whether you're gaining wisdom or not is really answering that particular question of is that a fact or is that an opinion? Have you really gotten the data that shows that or are you simply making assumptions about things and you want to differentiate those? All right, so wisdom is that sort of ultimate point that helps you kind of clean up the, the, the noise, clean up the mess, and really get down to what's helpful to make decisions and actions. All right, so those are some key terms around how the process works and this concept of data information, knowledge, and wisdom. Now what I want to do is spend the rest of the time talking about some techniques that are available or some concepts that are available to help you make that transformation from data to wisdom and to use knowledge management in a broader, more effective sense. And the first one is called learning loops. Uh, this concept derives out of the work of a gentleman named Chris Argeris. And Argeris, as you can see, was a Harvard professor, and his specialty was really around organizational change, organizational development, and particularly around how an organization learns and how people learn and take that learning and put it into place. So really, Argeris, uh, in many ways, his work is the basis of the whole data to information to knowledge to wisdom sweep. Uh, and you, you probably won't find that connection if you look in the ITIL books, but when you read more about his theories and concepts, you can see the connection that knowledge management really derives from his and other works. So how do we connect what he talked about into our knowledge of service management? Well, he really talked about two things, theory of action and double loop learning. And we're going to go into each one. So theory of action, it's kind of how you um, take actions or make decisions, particularly in difficult situations or in uh, complex situations. Double loop learning is really more around the process of how you move from data to information to knowledge to wisdom and then back to data. So let's talk about those. So the theory of action is this concept that Every person in our, in our own way has an espouse theory, and this is what we feel we believe, this is what we tell people we believe, this is what we sort of um, throw out into the world as to how we behave, right? So you may have in your mind this concept that you are a law-abiding citizen. Right, so you, you follow the rules, you follow the laws, you do the things uh, that you're supposed to, and you, and you sort of tell people that. The reality, though, that Arger showed is that we actually have a theory in use that differs from our espouse theory. So theory in use is what we actually do. It's what our actions and decisions really come out to be, right? So it's more um, kind of, it's the mask, that's our espouse theory, and it's it's what's behind the mask. That's the theory in use. And to get the most effective use of knowledge management, what we need to do is bring a spouse theory in line with theory in use. So again, you see you may have an espouse theory of I'm a law-abiding citizen, but your real uh, theory in use is, or theory in action is, police aren't going to ticket me if I just go a few miles over the speed limit. Okay, well, those, that's really a contradiction. If you're a law-abiding citizen, it's a very black and white kind of thing. Uh, but if you say, well, I'm a law-abiding citizen sometimes, okay, well, then you have a difference between those two things. 
knowledge management doesn't work well or taking the lessons of knowledge management doesn't work well if those two things are different. All right, so that's, that's we have to have that foundation in knowledge is that um, when we're taking an action, we, hey, we're going to improve. So, so an example in service management or IT a lot of times is an organization says, we believe in learning and development, right? We believe you should do training with ITSM Academy or, or use consulting through tech systems. But then when you actually go to do it, they say, yeah, but there's no money for that. Okay, well, that's an espouse theory versus a theory in use, and what knowledge management is telling us is, if you're going to say one thing, you should do that thing. So how do we tie that into the second concept here of double loop learning? Well, double loop learning is this idea that we start with some assumption or belief, right? That's that espouse theory. We then plan some action based on our espouse theory, and then we have some results from that action. Now, what should happen in a double loop learning system is that once you have those results, you should go back against your assumptions and beliefs and see, was my espouse theory, as I originally put it out there, actually the one I put into action through planning? Are those two the same? Right, so that my results kind of influence and make me change some of my spouse theory so that it aligns to my theory in action or the other way around. What generally happens, though, is we get caught into what's known as the loop of inference. And the loop of inference is where we no longer go back and question uh, our assumptions and our belief. We're perfectly fine with living in a contradiction between the theory we have in our head and the one that we project outward. And we keep doing the same things over and over, expecting different results, right? That's the definition of insanity. So we never go back and question our assumptions. We simply go back to our last action and act as if nothing had happened, right? And we call that the loop of inference because we infer that the assumptions and the beliefs and all of those things are good, they're solid, they're steady, they hold true for all time, and that there is no inherent contradiction between our beliefs and our actions, but in reality there is a contradiction. So let's talk about that in terms of service management. So we can apply that in the same way as service management. You see all I've done is taken data, information, knowledge, and wisdom and replace them into this loop. So data is where we start. We start with these certain facts, we convert that into information, and then we lead that to knowledge. What we should be doing is the next step should take our wisdom and lead us back and say, is the data still good? The problem is many organizations and people in IT are particularly guilty of this is we assume, we infer that the last time we make, made a decision that that information is still good. That information may be a month old, a week old, a year old, 10 years, 30 years old worth of data, but we still believe it's good. When in reality, it's probably not. And the only way we can know that is to go back and check that data. So we want to get out of this loop of inference where we get caught and we just get caught in this knowledge loop and move forward to converting that knowledge back into wisdom and that wisdom leading us back to the data to complete the knowledge management loop. All right, so how do we use this effectively? Well, let's look at an example where it has not been used effectively, and then we can get some insight in how to do it right. So many of you might be familiar that many years ago there were a couple of um, disasters with some of the uh, NASA shuttles, particularly the Columbia one that came in over Texas, exploded on, uh, on reentry. And most people looked at it and said when they did the investigation, oh, there was a piece of foam that came off of the, the shuttle, went through the wing, and that's what caused it. And long effort to put together an investigation by NASA, and everyone was very surprised when the final results came out. And although they indicated, yes, the foam uh, breaking through the wing was a trigger, that was not really what caused the, the accident. What caused the accident was the loop of inference or a failure to use knowledge management. 
So you can see here, these are actual uh, pieces of information from the NASA report. So missed opportunities, ineffective communication channels, flawed analysis, ineffective leadership. These are all signs of poor knowledge management, right? We're not learning lessons. Barriers against consenting uh, views or not uh, allowing people to say no, people putting on blinders. This is how we've always done it here at NASA. In fact, at one point in time, uh, there was a clear statement in the, the report that said, well, the last six times that we had these kind of events with the shuttle, no one died, no one's going to die this time. Right, so that was the thinking, these blind spots because of lack of knowledge management. Uh, I'm not going to read this whole slide, but the, it does go on to kind of point that out. So again, there were compromises, resource constraints, priority issues, schedule pressures. Many of you are might right now thinking, wow, that sounds like our projects, our project management. Yeah, so this ties into project management as well because when a project is done, we're supposed to be doing lessons learned, but what happens is those go into onto the shelf or into the garbage or into a file somewhere and we never learn anything. That's again lack of knowledge management. Characterization that we were operational rather than developmental, right? We're such in a hurry to get things operational, we don't take that time to recognize are we learning and have we caught all of the things that we need to. So it comes down to this, right? Reliance, I'm reading here in the middle of this in red, reliance on past success as a substitute for sound engineering practices, such as testing to understand why systems were not performing in accordance with requirement specifications. Right? So it was saying right there, we did not learn our lessons. We did not go back and look at what we've done before to know whether there were signals or signs that this kind of thing would have caused issues. Right? So very much a loop of inference, we're caught in this, it really wasn't uh, the foam, it was the culture, the way we thought about things in NASA, how they operated, and you can see more of that down there. Lack of integrated management, informal chain of command and decision-making processes, really just assuming because we had never, um, you know, or the last six times that we'd had foam strikes on the wing, no one had died, no one was going to die this time. Right, and some of you are probably thinking about that, or maybe you you yourself have said these things before. Well, this is the way we've always done it around here. All right, that is not an indicator from a knowledge management standpoint that that's how you should continue to do it. All right, so how do we take these and use this effectively? First of all, we have to make sure we're bringing that theory and practice, or theory and use or action, in line with our espouse theory. If we say we're going to improve something and we're going to have a mindset of continual improvement, we actually have to show that improvement. All right, we have to each time we're doing something go back to our pool of data and say, is it still accurate? Is it still relevant? It might be. And this is not saying that every day of every minute you should be checking your, your data. But if it's been a week, a month, a year, 10 years, 20 years, it's probably time to check your data. Asking that question, is this fact or opinion? Show me the data. Show me the, the actual numbers that prove this. Otherwise, it's probably just an opinion and you're caught in the loop of inference. And again, make those decisions on that transformation of data, information, knowledge, not those long-standing assumptions. Don't just continue to assume that things have always been good, so they're always going to be good. All right, so that's, that's one way we can use this. All right, let's move on to systems thinking. So the second concept we have here comes out of the work of a guy named Peter Sanger Senge. He was MIT's School of Management, and he talked about this concept of systems thinking. Again, this is a fundamental concept that sits behind ITIL. Many people don't realize this, uh, whereby rather than taking a very siloed or individual single view of of problem solving, you should look at the overall system and what are the parts and pieces and the interconnections between those. This was also much of the thinking behind uh, the work of uh, William Edwards Deming, if you're familiar with him. Right? So uh, Deming was much earlier, Senge built on his work. So how does this connect 
into service management? Well, the key here is to see service management and its, and its processes not as individual elements, but as a system. And that what you are seeing perhaps as an issue in one area really isn't going to be resolved by fixing that part, say incident management. You may have to fix service strategy in order to fix service uh, transition, or you may need to fix service transition in order to fix incident management. Again, I'm not going to read all of this, but here are some of the characteristics that um, Senj put out as to what a system, right? It has parts, and parts in our case are processes. It's got a boundary, so there are uh, exterior parts to the system. Systems can be inside other systems. There's overlapped. They take inputs, they produce outputs. Sounds a lot like processes, right? Well, a process is really only one element of a system, right? And they aren't standalone, so processes don't work in a vacuum. So think about that last statement, right? System is autonomous and fulfilling its purpose. A car is not a system. A car with a driver and fuel and uh, wheels and those things is a system. So all of those individual parts and pieces working together for the whole purpose. Some of you may who've uh, had me for a trainer or seen presentations I've done may have seen this before. Uh, some of you may have not. This is service management. This is ITIL. And it surprises a lot of people when they see this because it's one of the first times that they've started to see the interconnections between everything. And one of the things that um, I, I like to show to or tell to people is if I were to really put every connection and every interface in this system, you would not be able to read this chart because every process interacts and interfaces with every other process in some way. But by kind of talking about the major connections, we can see that there are three sort of really key processes in service management, and one of them is not incident management. So it's things like business relationship management, service level management, and change management. And I've always advocated that those are really the three most powerful and important of the processes. And if you're going to start somewhere in service management, that's where you should start. So knowledge management here is sort of leading us to understand that service management is a system and that what we should do is start to see it as a system and that knowledge management is a key part of that system that kind of keeps it all flowing together. So knowledge is the process that makes things flow along these lines. So what uh, Senja talked about is how do you take um, what you're doing as an individual and convert that ultimately up to systems thinking. And what you have to do is go through what he calls five disciplines. And we can map data, information, knowledge, and wisdom into those disciplines. So first of all, in an organization, you have to have sort of personal mastery. If you don't understand your work and your uh, day and how you're um, producing data, you need to master that. Once you have that, once you have good data, then you have to start thinking about mental models. So what are the mental models? And again, this goes back to those espouse theories and those theories in action. What are those assumptions that you're holding? What are those generalizations or how are you thinking about the data? Right? Are you stuck in that loop of inference? Then you have to start bringing your vision or your mental model together with other people's mental models and build a shared vision. So what does it mean for the organization to have this knowledge? Are there differences in how different departments or different people are seeing things? Are you all on the same page? Then there's the wisdom side, which is team learning. That is, as you take actions, you reuse that knowledge and that wisdom to learn from it. And you start coming together and learning as a team or as an organization, and you start to suspend some of those individual assumptions and push those aside. That then leads you to the fifth discipline called systems thinking. And systems thinking kind of thinks about all four of those together, right, and sees knowledge management not just as the knowledge base, but as this transformation between data, information, knowledge, and wisdom. 
So how do we kind of put this into use? How do we put that into a service management type use, that concept? Well, what we want to do is start putting in place monitoring control loops. And this comes um, directly out of guidance from ITIL and uh, in the service operation book. And what you need to do is you, you start with a process. So say incident management, you identify what are the inputs to the process, what are the outputs, and then you put in place a mechanism to do the monitoring control. So as you're doing the process activity, you're using things like measures and metrics to monitor. And that's a whole other conversation, but uh, oftentimes metric measures and metrics are misused and not seen as results monitoring, they're seen more as targets to drive after. Really measures and metrics are part of this monitor control loop where they look to uh, monitor results. You take those results and you compare them against something. Well, what are you comparing them against? You're comparing them against some kind of norm. Where does that norm come from? That norm comes from your SLAs. So you, that's why service level management is such an important process because it establishes the expected norms. If your norm, say, for a given incident is we want to have things resolved uh, as quickly as possible and we set some time frames against that, what you should be doing is monitoring your process to see are you uh, within those guidelines or, or not within those guidelines and it's not the process itself that sets those. Norms are always set exterior to a process. Once we see whether or not we're in line with those norms, we then have to take the control actions. So monitoring is the equivalent of gathering data, comparing is where we're starting to convert that into information, uh, and controlling is where we're starting to convert that into knowledge, and then once we have those control actions, actually putting them in a place, changing our process, changing our procedures, our work instructions to work more effectively, that's where wisdom happens. Right, so if you're not using this concept of, of uh, monitor control you, loops, you might think about that because it is a good way to use this idea of systems thinking. You'll notice that there's sort of uh, everything is interconnected. There's no sort of loose ends hanging here uh, in terms of these monitor control loops. All right, the last area we want to talk about here is effective questioning. And I, I did a presentation on this at Fusion uh, several years ago, so some of you might have seen that. Uh, but I think it is, a, again, another way or another area where we can kind of go beyond just those knowledge base and really um, make more effective use of knowledge management. And this work comes out of the, the work of a guy named Benjamin Bloom, and he was an educational psychologist uh, who kind of developed the basic theories around we, how we master and learn things. And you'll notice the common theme here. Each of these gentlemen or, or uh, people that uh, work in this space are really about learning. So data information, knowledge, and wisdom, and knowledge management is really about learning. So he said there are really three domains in which we have to master things. Cognitive, that is our thinking. Affective is our, our uh, emotional. And psychomotor is our physical and uh, kinesthetic. And what he did was he said, for each of these domains, and we're going to focus on the cognitive one, for each of those domains, there's sort of a model that you follow in order to learn. And you build knowledge and mastery as you move through this, this uh, model. So again, another way for us to start to convert data into wisdom. So here's Bloom's Taxonomy. If you've taken ITSM Academy uh, courses, you are probably very familiar with this diagram. And so uh, this is something I, I help work with in terms of uh, this concept of Bloom's Taxonomy and the courses. So the idea here is if you want to learn something, you really need to be at level six. Right? Learning occurs at level six evaluation, but you can't simply jump to level six. You have to work your way up the steps. You start with knowledge, you move up through comprehension, and this is what we focus on in classes like ITIL Foundation. You then move into application and analysis. The new ITIL practitioner, uh, the intermediate classes are all focused on sort of this level. And then as you move into those higher levels of synthesis and evaluation, that's really where you're getting into um, learning around expert and master. All right, so here's the basic of the, the taxonomy. Let's talk about it a little bit more. 
So how do we use Bloom? Well, what we can do is look at what each of the levels tells us. Level one, that's really just information or data gathering. Level two is where we start to transform or convert that data into information. Level three is where we start to make use of that data and that information. Level four is where we take some of that data information and we start to question it and deconstruct it and ask those how and why questions. That then leads us to level five. Level five is where we actually bring together some of these new ideas that we're learning, this new knowledge. That then leads to level six, which is really wisdom. Right, so where we start to identify, have we done a good job or haven't we? Now you'll notice as you move up this scale, and it's kind of hard for some people, you're going from more objective to more subjective kind of ideas. IT people have this tendency to want to stay with the hard and the fast and the objective, but you don't gain any wisdom that way. So here's that conversion, right? So here as we can see, we're moving from data to information, to knowledge, ultimately to wisdom. And again, we're moving away from single individual points up into the big picture. And so what knowledge management really tells us is never just focus on a single individual point. What is that point telling you in a bigger picture? So how does that point of data mix with other points of data to give you information, to knowledge, up to wisdom? So Bloom allows us to kind of do that. So how do we use him? Well, what Bloom did was put together a set of what he called question words. And the idea here is when we want to convert data into wisdom, we have to ask effective questions. Well, how do we do this? Well, we want to start by identifying which layer we're really examining. Where are we at? Are we at the information to knowledge transformation? Are we at the data to information transformation? That's more in the knowledge and comprehension. We want to look at that and then we want to pick the right word and use that to drive a particular question to get an answer. Now you'll note these, this flow can also map, as we see, into the ITIL lifecycle itself and shows that as we move from just knowledge, we're moving from sort of rather operational type things into more strategy. And CSI is really about using the whole thing. So knowledge management in many ways is the connection between processes, between the other life cycle stages, operation, transition, design, and strategy, into CSI. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to decide which level we're at. We're going to then pick the appropriate question word from Bloom. We're going to add in a helper word just so we can make it into an effective grammatically correct uh, process, or sentence. And then we're going to add a process word. And that's going to lead us to much more effective questionings, uh, questions. So at the service desk, rather than having individual uh, analysts just simply say, well, what happened? Can you tell me what happened? That's really not an effective question. It's not sort of identifying where the issue is. A better example would be, can you describe the incident? And if we go back up one, we can see that word like describe really tells us at that knowledge. We're just trying to get some basic data here. Right? We're not trying to make evaluations. We're not trying to determine why. We're simply trying to identify what is the data that I have available. Then I can take that and ask further questions along the line and get better and better answers. So I might start moving up through into areas like uh, strategy or design or transition. How would you identify a utility? How would you, how would you define utility in your organization? What would you, uh, or how would you define, or what terms would you use to define what a service is in your organization? That's effective questioning, and effective questioning leads to identifying better data, which leads us to better information, better knowledge, and then ultimately wisdom. And what oftentimes you'll see is if you're struggling, say, with defining with with services, well, which services? What are the services we offer? If you look back through that sort of cycle of DIKW, what you'll actually probably see is that you don't have a very succinct and clear definition of what makes a service. You've made some assumptions, again, back to those loop of inference. You've made some um, belief statements 
but you've not gone back and said, here are the specifics as to what a service is. And that's really what this effective questioning is trying to get you to do, is kind of look back, have you done the effective questioning up through Bloom's taxonomy so that once I have a definition of service, I can map things into that and say, this meets the definition of service, this does not meet the definition of service, that will then ultimately lead to better identification of service, which will lead to a better service catalog, a better service portfolio, better delivery of service and operations. So hopefully you can see how it's sort of all connected through this string of DIKW. Right, so how do we use this? Well, we have to understand Bloom's taxonomy, right? What are the various levels? Understand that we have uh, different levels for data versus information versus knowledge versus wisdom, and that we shouldn't necessarily jump right to wisdom type questions. So you don't want to start necessarily with the why questions. You want to sort of end there, and they are the more important questions. But in order to get to the why questions, you may have to ask the what and the where. And then you want to make sure that you're using those effective questioning words at the appropriate level to get the right kind of data information, knowledge, and wisdom so that you can then learn lessons from that. Ultimately, you do want to focus on the how and the why more than the what and the where, but as I just indicated, you don't want to forego those. And oftentimes in IT, that's what we want to do. Oh, we don't have time, or this has to be done right away. Well, it's really not going to take you a whole lot of time just to make sure that you really know the true what and the true where, that the data is still good because that data is going to lead to better information, knowledge, and ultimately better decisions and better wisdom. All right, so bringing it together, let's kind of talk about sort of at a high level what I've gone through. So first of all, the key thing about knowledge management is learning, and that applies whether you're thinking about the whole knowledge management process as a system, as a whole, or you're really only focusing on the knowledge base. So when you're using your knowledge base, are you learning something from it? Are you looking at which articles are being tapped more than other articles? Are you looking at articles that uh, maybe get dismissed or don't, you know, someone uses it uh, or attaches it to a record, but then you're not really resolving something? Is the knowledge in that uh, knowledge article as effective as it could be? That's when you start to ask those effective questions, right? So that's a, that's a good question right there. Is the knowledge as effective or has the knowledge been developed in such a way that it is effective? Right, so you want to kind of start asking those questions about those. It may be that you have too many knowledge articles and it's too much for people to think of. So this is really all about learning. You also need to have a clear understanding of the difference between data, information, knowledge, and wisdom, when you should be uh, focusing on which one at which time and how they're used. Remember, data is really just that raw facts. You need that to sort of start the whole process, but ultimately you want to move up to that wisdom. You want to use double loop learning. That is, clarify that the data is still good. Don't get caught in the loop of inference. Get rid of those assumptions and those beliefs that maybe are months, years, decades old. Uh, you know, try to watch for people who are using the, well, we've been doing it for 27 years and it's worked since then, so it's always going to work. No, that's not a truism. Perhaps it might but it's not something you can just simply uh, continue to bank on and you really want to kind of watch how people are doing that and, and kind of tie it into organizational change. You want to see service management as a system, right? So you don't want to look just at a siloed incident management process because what you're going to find is you cannot improve incident management by doing more incident management. In order to improve incident management, you really have to look at some of the outside things and say, all right, if I'm gonna do incident better, if I'm gonna reduce my resolution rates, I'm gonna reduce the number of incidents coming in, I really need to do better problem management. 
In order to do better problem management, I probably need to do better change management. So start seeing those connections, start seeing that as a whole as opposed to these individual items. It may be good to start with an individual process or an individual aspect, but that is not where you need to end and knowledge management is really telling us you need to look at that bigger uh, system and how it all of works, how it works. And then finally, ask effective questions. Those effective questions such as how do we um, make a more effective strategy or can you describe the incident or why are we having so many problems or what is my, what might be the cause of some of these issues, right? Ask more effective questions to get you uh, to convert data into information to knowledge, ultimately wisdom in a more effective, efficient, economical manner. So that's what I've got for today. So at this point in time, I'm going to um, open it up for comments, questions, frustrations, hostilities, ponderings, queries.